everyone, and welcome to Authors at Google Ann Arbor. We are proud to have Steve Lado here again with us today. Uh, you may remember him from his recent chat with us about Michigan's Columbus, the life of Douglas Houghton. Today, he's here to present to us and talk to us about Chrysler's Turbine Car. So, forward written by Jay Leno, and we have the Wall Street Journal article for all of you to view as well. Um, this story takes place in 1964. Chrysler built a fleet of turbine cars, automobiles with jet engines, and lent them out to the members of the public. The fleet logged over a million miles. The exercise was a raging success, and this is the story. Thank you. Well, if you look at the image on the screen, this right here is a bunch of guys standing around a car. And uh, the reason that this is a momentous moment, uh, 1953, is that these gentlemen are lowering a jet engine into a car. And many people who've heard of the turbine car project know that Chrysler and GM and Ford all experimented with jet engines in cars for a period of time. But a lot of people are not aware of the fact that Chrysler actually spent 25 years developing jet engine technology uh, in the automotive field. And they actually got further along than anybody else did. So uh, this is a great occasion and I'll talk to you some more about some of the people in this photograph. On the far right is a man named George Huebner. He was the head of the turbine car program um, and uh, a very, very uh, flamboyant gentleman. Uh, I only found one photograph of him where he's not wearing an expensive suit, uh, but in this image you'll see that he is. And then uh, standing next to the car with his right hand on the fender of the car wearing a dark suit is a guy named Dr. Sam Williams. I'll talk some more about him as well. But like I said, they're just here lowering an engine into a car. This would be 1953. So, uh, they did put the jet engine in the car and they took it out for a spin and they called up all the local press and said, come on out, bring your news cameras, your uh, uh, reporters, your journalists. And of course, that's the whole host of people you see on the left-hand side of the screen there. And this is the public unveiling of the first jet-powered car. And it was a huge news event. If you look at the papers from the time, not just the local papers, but even the national newspapers, like the New York Times or even like Time Magazine or Look Magazine or Life Magazine or any of those, um, there'd be stories about the jet-powered cars being built by Chrysler. And a lot of people who aren't familiar with the technology might not know this, but jet engines offer some big advantages over the typical piston engine. Jet engines got fewer moving parts, it weighs less, it spins, the internal parts spin rather than reciprocate, meaning that uh, pistons go back and forth and cause an engine to shake or vibrate. Piston engine spins, so therefore it's much smoother. Um, but the important thing now that we look back on it and realize is, a jet engine will burn on, run on anything that burns. So you can run a jet engine on not only on gasoline, but alcohol, kerosene, diesel, vegetable oil, peanut oil, Chanel No. 5, vodka, tequila, uh, VO5 hairspray. They actually do demonstrate running the cars in these things. But again, during this time frame, gasoline costs so little that very few people cared. They'd say, well, why do we need a cheaper alternative to gasoline when we've got gasoline? So. Um, the program gets developed, they start building these cars, and as they're develop, developing them, they're making the engines more and more efficient. Uh, here's another one of the cars that has a turbine engine in it. Many of the early cars uh, were simply other Chrysler products that they had shoehorned a jet engine into. So uh, again, nothing on this car would tell me it's a jet engine, except that it sounded different. So when this car drove by you, it would sound like a low-flying jet. And um, I can tell you it's a driven one, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but that's that's the, the main difference to the average person on the street. This right here is a picture of George Huebner, and like I said, it's the only picture where he's not wearing a jacket. And the reason is, and he's the second man from the right, he was the head of the turbine car program, and he's the one who came to Chrysler and said, I really want to build jet-powered cars here. And he got them to put up the investment, let him hire the, the team. He had his whole turbine department built around this. During the same time, though, Chrysler was actually known as being the engineering company. Of the big three, Chrysler was best known as being the innovators in engineering. They also did stuff with the space program. So the man standing to Huebner's right with the X on his shirt, that's Werner von Braun. And uh, those of you who remember the Apollo program, Werner von Braun is a German scientist who came over here after World War II and helped us put a man on the moon. And uh, Huebner worked with von Braun on missiles at Chrysler. Uh, Chrysler helped build the missiles for the Redstone program, and some of the earliest space stuff was built by Chrysler. Uh, and in case you're curious, Chrysler also helped build a lot of uh, military stuff. So army tanks, for instance, Chrysler was building. So we don't think of them today in the military sense, nor do we think of them in the rocket sense. But at the time, Chrysler was known cutting-edge technology. So here's George Huebner, dressed more appropriately, wearing a nice suit and tie. He was actually, an, it's, it's an interesting thing, 
he was an extroverted engineer. And anybody who knows an engineer knows how, how um, uh, oxymoronic that is, that he's outgoing, flamboyant, loved attention and publicity, and he was an engineer. And in fact, after he passed away, his, um, uh, all of his papers and research were donated to the Bentley uh, Historical Archives, which is where I did a lot of the research for this book, so it's right around the corner here. But this is George Huebner, and anytime a camera was around, it seems, he got himself photographed near a turbine-powered car. And so this is a car about 1961 or 62, uh, and that's a jet engine under the hood, and some of the uh, items that go into a jet engine there. And I'll talk about that in just a second. And, oh, yeah, okay. And this is another uh, turbine-powered car that George Huebner is kneeling behind. And this one does say across the deck that it says turbine special. And as Chrysler became more and more confident that the cars would work, they started putting things on the cars to indicate that they were, in fact, turbine-powered. Uh, George here in this picture is demonstrating that the exhaust gases coming out of this car are not dangerous. One of the most common misperceptions about the program was that the jet engines were dangerous. And I, to this day, run into people who say, oh, I understand they killed that program because the, the exhaust was so hot it burned the pavement or catch cars on fire or kill children. <laughs> and the, the exhaust was actually cooler than the exhaust coming out of a typical, typical piston engine car at the time. So that's George Huebner holding a handkerchief by the, by the, the exhaust here to demonstrate that. Uh, on another occasion, he brought out some um, uh, pretty young women wearing uh, dresses, skirts, and uh, had them adjust their nylons in front of the exhaust pipe to show that it wouldn't burn a woman's nylons. And of course, the photographers ate it up because um, they were mostly men, and the women were pretty. So uh, here's another Chrysler-powered car again, you know, it's turbine special. As they got the cars practical, they decided they were going to start doing endurance stuff with them to show how dependable they were. So on a couple occasions, George Huebner, and remember this is a guy that's very, very high executive at Chrysler, and some of his uh, co-workers actually drove these cars cross-country. So they would take a car, like say the New York Auto Show, and have a press event outside, and the guys would all drive off into the sunset. And a couple thousand miles later, they'd have a press event in Los Angeles where they'd all arrive at some hotel and say, hey guys, we're here, we just drove this thing cross-country. So several of these cars were driven cross-country, and relatively trouble-free. Uh, while researching the book, not only did I interview the engineers who designed these things, I actually designed or interviewed some of the engineers who drove these things cross-country. And they were just talking about just you get on the freeway and just cruising along in a jet-powered car. And, you know, it's pretty cool. So here's one of the cars on the top that was driven uh, cross-country. You see on the side there's a map there just in case you get lost to let you know where in the country uh, that car has been. And again, Chrysler was doing this. They are getting a lot of publicity out of this. And, you know, some people have looked back on the program and said, obviously, we're not driving jet-powered cars today. What did Chrysler get out of this program if they didn't get jet-powered cars? Well, they got a lot of free publicity. Um, well, not free, but it wasn't advertising that they had to pay money for. So anytime these cars would show up someplace, the press would show up, and then you'd see these stories splattered all over the papers. Chrysler unveils another jet-powered car. Here's George Huebner on one of his cross-country trips. That's his wife. And um, these are obviously publicity photos, but you know they'd be leaked to the press as if they were candid shots. And I can tell you that they're not candid because, among other things, again, George is very well dressed. You'll notice he's sticking his head out the window because he learned very early on if you don't do that, you don't show up in the pictures as, as prominently. And of course, you'll notice that he's uh, showing the intricate workings of the turbine engine to the bellhop there on the top <laughs> right. And then on the bottom right, he's discussing the shape of the contiguous 48 states with some executives from Chrysler who just happened to be there when he left. But again, the publicity shots. And a lot of these uh, photographs were taken because they had publicity guys following these guys around, photographing everything, interviewing them, and just feeding these stories to the press. So, like I said, the program started in 1953. It ran to 1978. So for 25 years, there's a steady supply of this stuff in the press. So this is an aerial shot looking down on the engine, uh, one of the jet engines that they put into a car, a turbine engine. And um, you'll notice that uh, in the front, there's two things that look like uh, beer kegs. Those are actually air cleaners. So for the car guys in the room, uh, you know that an air cleaner normally sits on top of the engine. But a turbine engine, of course, uses huge quantities of air as well as uh, pretty large quantities of fuel. And um, a lot of the noise you associate with a jet engine, if you were to go walk along the tarmac at an airport, the sound you hear, half the sound you hear is coming from the front end where the air is coming into the engine. And so to quiet these engines down, they got those gigantic air cleaners there. And they figured out if they faced them at each other, it would actually kind of cancel out some of the noise. So in later years, they actually got a housing that went over the whole thing. But those are just two gigantic air cleaners. And directly behind that is uh, the turbine engine. 
they would come up with different generation turbine engines and they would number them. And so this is a cutaway of the fourth generation turbine engine. And at this point in time, they'd worked out enough of the problems of the technology to where they had an engine that was dependable and was relatively bulletproof. Because they came up with an idea to promote the project that they're going to build a fleet of cars and lend them to the public. So that if you were in America in 1963, you'd hear on the news that Chrysler was building jet cars and they're willing to lend them to anybody who wants one. If you want one, write to Chrysler and they might give you one. And so they got flooded with requests for these cars, but to do that, obviously, Chrysler's got to have a car that they can toss the keys to and say, here, go drive this car, knowing that the average knucklehead's not going to take it out and blow it up. Because, as you can imagine, if they were to do that, like, say, Dodge Vipers, and let people drive them, half of them would come back with blown engines, right? So they have to make an engine that's bulletproof in that respect. And so this is the fourth generation engine, and this is the engine that they decided was good enough to do that. And it actually was. So they actually uh, assembled the cars uh, in a plant on Greenfield Road in Detroit. The plant is still there, although the plant now is being used to make popcorn, I kid you not. <laughs> and the cars in the background, I'll show you some better pictures in a second, but the cars were hand-built in Italy by a company called Ghia. And some of you car guys know this, that there's a Carmen Ghia car that Volkswagen marketed. Ghia is a builder of, they refer to as coach builders, but they build the bodies of cars. They did a lot of show cars for Chrysler. And the cars in question, we often refer to these as the Ghia turbine car, built in 1963. They built a fleet of 55 of these cars. The cars were relatively, for the most part, hand-built. They had aluminum body panels. They had leather interiors. And 54 of the 55 cars were identical. Same color, same interior, same everything, down to the point where even the same key would start all 55 cars. <laughs> so this right here is what the Ghia turbine car looks like in color. Uh, that paint is referred to as turbine bronze. Chrysler wanted to come up with a color that was unique, but also seemed kind of space age. And um, if you were in southeastern Michigan in particular, but anywhere in America between 63 and 66, you would see these cars on the road from time to time. You couldn't miss them because they were an unusual color, and they sounded like jets. So, I was born in 1962. I remember as a very small child seeing one of these cars. And the, the, the two things you remember, the color and the sound. So this car right here is the one that Jay Leno owns. And I'll tell you a little bit about the story in a second. But that's what all these cars looked like. The car was designed by a guy named Elwood Engel. And Elwood Engel had come over to Chrysler's design studios from Ford. And when he was at Ford, he worked on the Thunderbirds. So many people look at this and they go, hey, it's a T-Bird. Well, it's similar because the same guy designed it. Some people jokingly call this the Engelbird. But um, it's the Chrysler Ghia turbine car. Um, and we call it the turbine car because it actually does not have a name. Um, they toyed with the idea about naming it something. You know, you don't have cars that don't have names. And they're going to call it the Typhoon. And they had some other names they kicked around, but they decided just to go ahead and just call it the turbine car. So on the side there next to the gas cap on the left, you'll see the tail end. It does say turbine on the side. That's all it says. It doesn't say anything else. Um, a lot of people like the space age styling of the car. Everything about the car is designed to remind you that this is a jet car. So you'll notice those things sticking off the back with the fins on them. Those are the backup lights. But they're designed to look cool. People always assume you walk over and like, feel hot air coming out of those. No, 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 that's just backup lights. Um, and again, you know, notice a really unusual sweep to the back there to evoke like, you know, fins and rockets and so on. Uh, they put those styling touches, those aluminum fins on everything. The bezels around the headlights have got cooling fins on them. The little rod that holds the rear view mirror to the glass, the windshield, has got cooling fins on it. It doesn't need them, obviously, but they did it because they thought it was cool. So this is inside one of the cars, and I'll tell you a little bit more about this car in a second, but um, again, all the cars looked identical on the inside. And if you just glance at this at first glance, you think, well, that looks like any other car from the 1960s, except that the right-hand side is a tachometer, which goes to 60,000 RPM. Your average car today goes to about 6,000 RPM. But of course, the turbine engine spins very, very fast. So the tachometer is at 60,000 RPM. The temperature gauge goes to 2,000 degrees, whereas the temperature gauge on your car might go to 200. But again, it's measuring something different. The temperature gauge in your car measures the coolant temperature in the radiator. These cars don't have radiators. They don't have oil systems. These cars, like I said, have fewer moving parts. They also have fewer systems involved. So it's actually measuring temperature at the gas generator stage where the fuel is being burned. So uh, that would be quite high. Again, you'll notice the styling touches with the aluminum fins up there by the front of the um, center hump there. Again, just, just for the aesthetic purpose. Um, and uh, other than that, it's just a typical 1960s Chrysler styling. 
So the cars were lent out, and what they did is they said, you know, if you want to borrow one of these cars for three months, they got buried, as you might imagine, with requests from people saying, I want one. So they went through all the people's names that they got, and they tried to scatter them around the country, but they lent them out to 203 different families over the period of two years. And what they would do is they'd pick some family, um, you know, in Nebraska, and they'd say, hey, you're going to get a car, is that cool? And they'd check them out and make sure they don't have a criminal record or something. And then they would call the local press and have a big press event. And so a lot of times George Huebner would show up to toss the people the keys to their new turbine car. And sometimes it would just be a guy from, from Chrysler. And there's often a guy named Bill Carey, who is this gentleman here. And he's also the man on the cover of the book. And Bill Carey's a fascinating guy. I interviewed him for this book. And he was um, a, a technician at Chrysler who came to Chrysler when he heard that they were going to start building turbines. Um, he would worked in the military on turbine aircraft uh, technology on helicopters. And um, when he went to Chrysler, they said, we've got just the job for you. You're going to be the main mechanic on this fleet of cars. So they built the 55 cars and lent them out to the public. Bill Carey was the guy who was tasked with going around, keeping the cars running, delivering them to people. And then if they broke down, he got the phone call. And he told me that occasionally he'd get a phone call at 3 o'clock in the morning, and they'd say, uh, we just got a phone call from one of the users down in Texas. The engine just blew up. And he would literally hop on a on a plane, fly to Texas, swap the engine out, and they try to do it as quickly as possible to get the car back on the road again. Now, the cars that were involved in the program logged over a million miles um, over the period of a couple years. And statistically speaking, it was very, very successful. The cars were very, very dependable. But even so, he did get these odd late night phone calls. This is obviously a posed photograph, though, where he's pointing at the engine, just in case these people didn't know where it was. And you have a nice young 60s couple straight off of a, a you know, sitcom. Uh, the man in the hat and the thick glasses and the woman with her little babushka on um, were, were probably just wishing the photographers would go away so they could get in the car and drive it. But these were gigantic big press events. And I also interviewed a lot of the people who got to borrow the cars. And if you think about it, you, know, you get to borrow a jet car for three months. And, and Chrysler said, as long as you put gas in it or fuel of some sort, um, and give it back to us, we'll pick up all the rest. So they paid for the maintenance, they paid for the insurance, and if you had any problems, they'd come out and fix it, no, no questions asked, no charge. And so I got a lot of photographs from people I talked to, like this one. And here's a family that drove their car cross country, and there's some place uh, near the Continental Divide, and they hopped up to take a picture. And the amazing thing about the turbine engine, along with the other stuff I told you, is that you could go out on a, on a pitch, cold day, as cold as you can make it, and hit the starter, and the car will start instantly. It does not have the problem with the thick oil you have in a piston engine. Uh, there's much less friction inside the engine, so the cars will start immediately. And because they got their um, heat for the inside of the car off of the, they ran the exhaust gases through the, um, uh, the heating unit, you would have hot air instantly as well. So the defrosters and the heat work instantly. And um, for the engineers, uh, turbine engines run better with cold air because cold air is denser. And so uh, everyone I talked to who lived either out west or drove them out west, they said, yeah, these things ran great in the mountains, which is, you know, a lot of times people have trouble with piston engine cars driving through the mountains because of the carburetors and so on. So again, this is some people just driving theirs cross country. At the end of the program, they rounded the cars up and they were thinking about what to do next. And they considered the idea about mass producing jet powered cars. They thought these cars were practical enough to do that. The problem is that right at the late 1960s, three things happened. Uh, the problem of smog became very, very apparent in America. And people in America started complaining about smog and that we need to do something about smog, especially in California. So the Environmental Protection Agency was formed and they were given the task of doing something to clean up the air. And the first thing they attacked was automobiles and tailpipe emissions. And the guys at Chrysler spent all their time making the engines run more efficiently and more bulletproof. They hadn't really thought that much about emissions. So they couldn't do anything about the emissions on that short notice. The other problem is that um, the OPEC oil embargo hit in the late 60s, early 70s, where we actually had a gas crisis in America. And um, the federal government again stepped in and announced CAFE standards, which is the uh, corporate average fuel economy standards for all the cars that one car company builds. The turbine cars did not get good gas mileage. It wasn't bad gas mileage, but it wasn't good. And the problem is the CAFE standards that the government announced was simply, you guys have got to come out next year and have your gas standards here, the next year here, and this you know, escalated up. And they hadn't been working on that. So while they were thinking about could we defeat these problems, and there are some engineers at Chrysler who thought they could, um, Chrysler went into financial trouble. 
And we all know that Chrysler went bankrupt last year. Well, they actually almost went bankrupt in the late 1960s, early 1970s. And right while all those things were happening, the guys at the Turbine program were saying, yeah, but we can build these cars. And they couldn't. So this was the car that they were going to put on the road. Um, they actually toyed with the idea about building 500 of these. Now this right here is a Coronet. It's got a turbine engine in it, but it's the only one they built. They built one of these, and this has got the next generation engine past the one I showed you the cutout of. So this right here was what the Chrysler engineers, if you'd talked in the 1966s, if you'd asked them, could you make a car right now to sell to the public that would blend right in, perform like a, like a regular car, that the average person could drive, it's just as dependent or better, do you have one? That's it right there. Unfortunately, the three things I just told you about interfered. The other strange thing about the whole program is, as I mentioned you at the beginning, that the car was multi-fuel. The car would literally run on anything that burned, and you could mix those fuels. So let's suppose you've got a tank full of kerosene, and one day you're driving down the road, and you get low on, low on fuel, and you don't, can't find kerosene, well, you pull into a station and you put diesel into it. You can't find diesel, you can put tequila in it. You can't find tequila, you put Chanel number no. 5 in it. It's going to be expensive, but you can do it. And at the time that they first started the program in 53, they almost never even mentioned that aspect of it. I mean, I can find you press releases where they go, the turbine engine is better, it's lighter, it's simpler, it weighs less. And they wouldn't even mention the fuel economy, or the, the, the multi-fuel aspect of it. Later on, as they were struggling with the tailpipe standards and the cafe standards, somebody said, wait a second, this thing will burn non-petroleum-based fuels. We could run alcohol that our farmers could make by growing corn or growing you know, grass. Maybe we should emphasize that a little bit. So Chrysler started emphasizing that. But again, this is 1973. And this is a, uh, a Plymouth satellite. And in front of this, that's a turbine engine in that car there. In front of it is an engine, or a fuel stand that's got six different fuels on it. And it's got everything on there from uh, non-leaded gasoline to alcohol to a variety of mixtures and so on. And they do these demonstrations where they actually go up and fire the car up, have it running, and flip, switch, 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 to show that it would run flawlessly on these different fuels. But again, this is so late in the game that it didn't really have that much of an impact. One of the guys I interviewed for the book was a test driver who drove these things out at the Chelsea Proving Grounds. I mean, he literally put you know, hundreds of hours just driving a turbine car, just big laps in that big oval out there. And uh, he told me that he did a couple laps out there running um, vegetable oil. And he goes, yeah, he goes, it, it smelled like they were baking cookies. You know? <laughs> but um, you know, imagine what the world would be like if we were all driving cars that made it smell like we were baking cookies. Um, so uh, this is one of those things that I like to point out. Is this, is, this is sheer irony. One of the ugliest cars ever built in Detroit, and that's got a jet engine in it. Um, that is an Aspen, the sister car of the Volari. And um, uh, again, Chrysler was, the engineers were still working on developing the engine, making it better and better and better. The engine in this car was light years ahead of the one that they loaned out to the public. But, like I said, they couldn't make it run clean enough, the, the fuel economy wasn't good enough, and Chrysler was, at this point, really teetering on bankruptcy, so they couldn't do it. And one of the guys I talked to, who was involved in the program intimately, I said, what would it have taken you guys? Let's suppose that Chrysler said, let's pull the trigger, let's make these cars, mass produce them, put them on the road. And he said, we would have had to build whole plants from the ground up because they didn't have the infrastructure to manufacture the internal parts of the jet engine. And he said, that would have cost us about a billion dollars in 1970. And it didn't have a billion dollars. So this car uh, in front of the helicopter is the last turbine car Chrysler built. That's 1978. And again, extremely advanced engine in this car, extremely efficient, extremely you know, cutting edge. But at this point, they, were, they knew the program was winding down, and Chrysler pulled the plug in the program in 1978, so that you had 25 years of development of this, and then nothing. So that's the end of the program. At the end of the user program, there were 55 of the GIAC turbine cars out there. Chrysler rounded them up and destroyed 46 of them. And this is very reminiscent of the Who Killed the Electric Car with the EV1. General Motors, at the end of the program, rounded all the cars up and destroyed them. And I've spoken to the guys in the programs, why did they do that? And all of the car companies are hesitant to let their prototypes get put out into the world. Because if you think about it, right now when we think of the turbine car program, we think, oh, there's this fleet of cars, they look really cool, they ran really nice. If they let these cars get out to just average people, you're driving your turbine car along and the engine explodes. You and I can't fix it. So either now the car doesn't run, or we rip the engine out and we drop in a V8. Now we have a turbine engine body that's running a piston engine, and it starts diminishing the PR of this car. 
So they actually sent word out to museums and said, if you want one of these cars, you can have it. So they actually got six museums who took them up on the offer. They shipped the cars out, and they destroyed all the rest. And I've actually interviewed guys who were there at the wrecking yard in Romulus when they actually crushed and burned these cars. And I had one guy tell me, he goes, because I was crying like a baby. I mean, you know, he worked these cars for years, and now they're just destroying them. Um, there were people who wanted to buy the cars. Chrysler was getting letters from people saying, I want to buy one. I don't care what it costs, I'll buy one. And Chrysler was going, we, we can't sell it to prototype. So this car right here is one of the survivors. This photograph was taken in uh, Fort Wayne, Michigan, the fort down by Detroit. And um, they have, at the Detroit Historical Society, so many cars they can't display them all at their museum. And they were one of the people who took them up on the offer to accept one of these cars, but they had no place to put it, so they stuck it in their storage facility inside the bubble here. Um, I got to get in and see it and photograph it because I was trying to track down as many of them as I could. Uh, the Henry Ford Museum's got one. Uh, Chrysler has one at their museum as well, Walter Chrysler Museum up in um, Auburn Hills. There's one at the Smithsonian. There's one at the St. Louis Museum of Transportation. There's one at the Peterson Museum in LA. And then two of them are privately owned, one of which is owned by Jay Leno. That's me to the left of Jay Leno um, 50 pounds ago. And um, people say, wow, Jay's shorter than I thought. And I said, no, no, I'm taller than you thought. <laughs> um, but that's Jay's turbine car. He actually bought that from Chrysler um, about a year ago when he came into town to do those free shows up at the palace for unemployed people. And um, Chrysler had kept three cars for themselves. The three cars they kept were identical because all the cars were identical. So uh, Jay went over to Chrysler after he did one of the shows. He was talking to some of his friends over there. And he said, you know, you guys have got three of these cars. Do you really need three? And now, I wasn't privy to the conversations, but my understanding is that he talked them into selling him one of the three cars. They know he's a car guy. He'll take care of it. He's not going to blow it up and drop a slant six engine into it. He'll take care of it. And he'll see to it that it, 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 it's, it's good. So he got the car, and um, he brought it to California. This photograph is in Jay Leno's garage, and that's also what he calls the facility, uh, where he has 105 cars, 95 motorcycles, uh, a steam engine, a bus, and a bunch of other crazy stuff. He loves technology. Uh, and about an hour after this photograph was taken, he took me for a ride in one of his steam cars. He's got a collection of steam cars. He's also got a collection of electric cars. Uh, and he is as nice as he seems on TV. It's not an act. He's honest to God, a nice guy. And just as a side note, I'm actually doing a book signing with him day after tomorrow in Burbank. Um, I'm flying out and he's going to sit with me and sign books, which is a nice thing for him to do. But um, he let me drive the car. And that was the cool thing, is that I had talked to him previously about that I had written this book. And um, he said, well, if you're ever in California, I'll let you drive the car. So I got to California as fast as I could. And I go out there, and, and we go for a drive, and we're driving around Burbank. And, and we stopped so we could take some pictures. And the pictures I showed you earlier of in the parking lot, we took that day. And then uh, we're walking back to the car and said, you know, Jay, you, you did tell me I could, I could drive it. You know? And I thought he was going to say I just drive it in circles around the parking lot, which I would have been happy to do because like I said I drove it. So I go, oh, here you go, toss me the keys, and, we, and he let me drive it. And I said, well, where are we going? He goes, oh, go back to the garage. So I got to drive that car in traffic. And, of course, I'm sitting at a light thinking to myself, I'm going to be the knucklehead who's behind the wheel when we get rear-ended by somebody, and I'm going to go down in history as the guy who wrecked Jay Leno's turbine car. Didn't happen, though. We got it back safely, as evidenced by the photograph. So um, that's the story of the Chrysler turbine car. Um, and then while I was out there, I was talking to Jay, and I still hadn't found a publisher for the book. And he said to me, he goes, well, if it'll help you sell the book, I'll write you a forward for the book. And he's written forwards for other car books. And I said, I think it'll help. And he <laughs> agreed to write the forward for me. And that actually is what got me an agent, which got the book sold. The book came out a month ago. And it's actually doing pretty well. So um, it's interesting because a lot of people are familiar with the idea that there were turbine cars in the road. And some people even remember that Chrysler did this. But they had no idea how long the program lasted, 25 years or how many of these cars they built. They built 55 of those cars right there. And there was a, pretty, a, uh, there's a certain generational thing. When I do book signings, I can tell the older guys will go, I remember those cars. And the young people, of course, are like, what are you talking about? And it's because there was a time when you see those cars everywhere. And they, they were almost commonplace. And the fact that they disappeared completely, and now people go, hey, what happened to those turbine cars? So that's also why I wrote the book. So, any questions? Talk to me about um, when you went to see all the families that had driven these. What were kind of the stories that they had? Oh, yeah. No, I had a couple pictures in there of that, but you're right. Um, I actually, Chrysler put out a really nice book at the end of the program. Like, like a, I'm not sure what they did with it, but they put together a, 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 a synopsis of the program. They said, you know, because they had their PR people go out and interview these people, and, and they, they collated all the data. And, and they actually gave us, I actually have a list of the names 
occupations and ages of every single person in one of these cars, 203 oh. people. Now, remember, this is back in 1964, 63, 65. So I had to go and try to track these people down. So what I actually did is I sorted them by age and started from the youngest and went up. And I actually found something, because think about it, if you're 25 years old that long ago, you had, and next thing you know, a lot of these guys are no longer with us. But I tracked down maybe a dozen of them. And the stories were universally the same. They loved the car. Everywhere they went, it drew a crowd. They'd be, you know, driving to church and people would be waving and following them and, and you know, like they, they, they'd drive someplace and people would follow them to get up and talk to them. Uh, people would park in front of their house and people, others would come up and knock on the door and say, hey, can I look at your car? Um, Chrysler actually anticipated some of this and interestingly enough, for 1963, you cannot pop the hood in this car without getting inside of it. You also cannot pop the trunk without getting inside of it, even if you have the keys. Because back then, you know, cars, you walk up underneath the hood, just feel them and pop the hood with the thing underneath the hood. They were so worried about looky loos wanting to come by everywhere you'd go, they'd be like, well, I want to look underneath the hood. So they made it that way because they anticipated it. And sure enough, that's what happened. I actually spoke to some families who said that by the end of the three months, they're almost getting sick of the attention. They loved the car, but they couldn't go someplace without causing a commotion. And so, you know, I, I spoke to one uh, family in particular, and they said that they parked in a driveway. Every single day during dinner time, people knocking on the door, hey, can I see your car? Can I see your car? Can I go for a ride in your car? And sure enough, you, you can't turn that down. So you're giving people rides everywhere, giving rides to people in the car. That one family said they actually stuck it in the garage and closed the door when they wanted peace and quiet because otherwise they couldn't get any rest. Um, and, you know, um, one of the guys I interviewed for the book was 16 at the time that his parents got one of these cars. And Chrysler actually said, you know, hey, we had a problem letting this kid drive the car. I mean, he's in the family. He's got a license. They let him drive the car. So a 16-year-old boy for three months is driving his car to and from school. He's you know, driving around. And you know, it's all downhill from that point. You know? I don't care what car you get. When you turn 17, you've got to drive a turbine car. You know? and, and he told me, he said, you know, it, was, it was the hugest deal because he was the kid who got to drive a jet car. You know? But again, everywhere you go, it's causing a commotion. One guy told me, he said, he goes, you couldn't make a short trip in it. You couldn't like, hop in it and run to the store for a loaf of bread and come back. It would turn into an hour-long trip because everywhere you go, you know, hey, is that your car? Hey, can I talk about the car? And it got to the point where you, you, you had to do this. Uh, when Chrysler was interviewing people about the program, they would, and I actually have the question sheets they used, they were clearly aiming at trying to find people who were outgoing and would, wouldn't mind that kind of activity. But also they'd ask you, how often do you drive your car, where do you drive your car, and then where do you park your car when you're at work? And I talked to a guy who's a dentist in California, and he told me that he thinks he got the car because his dentist office is right at a major intersection. And he said, well, I have to park my car in front of my office. And he wasn't sure it was a good or bad thing. And he said, the guy called him right back. He's like, yeah, that's a good thing. Because, you know, his, this turbine car is in front of this doctor's office all day long. And that was, you know, getting the image out there. One of the cars actually starred in a movie. There's a movie called The Lively Set, starring James Darren and some other unknowns. And if you see the movie on, like, you know, some really bad channel on cable, um, in the opening credits, it's like the lively set in typical 60s, you know, there's an announcer going, you know, they race, they love, they have a good time, they listen to rock and roll music. And it goes starring James Darren, whoever the co-star is, and the Chrysler Turbine Car. And it's credited like it's an actor. And it's kind of funny because there's these shots in the movie where they, they do these close-ups, you know, and, and, and they do it back in front of a blue screen. Chrysler, that's the one thing Chrysler wouldn't do is they wouldn't let Hollywood get their hands in the car. So they actually sent the car to Hollywood and said, you can film it, but the only guy who can drive it is a guy named George Stetcher. And George Stetcher is a mechanic on the program. So all of the shots, the close-up, are in so close, you can see the guy sitting in the wrong car. The second they back up, they always back up far enough, you can't see it's actually a Chrysler mechanic driving it, not James Darren. So um, IMDB calls the movie a horrid piece of trash. But it's <laughs> got some great car chase scenes in there of a turbine car and some regular cars racing around out in the desert, which makes no sense at all for an auto race. But you know, typical Hollywood, you know, it's, it's, so like I said, but the car is credited like it's an actor, so that's kind of cool. Well, what's the performance of that compared to a normal car? You think a jet engine's going to have a lot of horsepower, or is it, did they scale it kind of way down so that it wouldn't be kind of ridiculous? It was scaled way down to fit underneath the hood, and it's also geared so it would behave more like a normal car. Um, one of the most amazing innovations with this car was that it has an automatic transmission in it, and it has a torque flight auto, which is a very, very common Chrysler transmission from the era. And to put power from the turbine engine to the rear wheels, they simply have uh, the turbine spinning in a, a wheel, a, a, a fan blade that's facing backwards. And there's nothing here. 
And then there's another fan blade that's attached to the input shaft of the transmission. So this air blowing over this fan, which drives the rear wheels in essence, okay? So what that did was it allowed them to basically not worry about people tearing up clutches or tra uh, manual transmissions, but it also um, uh, made it much simpler for them to build. The neat thing about that was is that the car didn't accelerate really quickly because they had geared so that it would run better at highway speeds. But if you really want, you know, back in the 60s, people want to step on the gas in the car and launch like a rocket. So some automotive guys who test drove the vehicles for auto magazines complained and said, hey, I drove this car in zero to 60s, like horrible. Well, it was horrible if you didn't know what you were doing. And George Huebner read a review, I think it's Motor Trend Magazine, where a guy said that the acceleration is horrible. I, it's horrible. It's, 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 these cars will never sell because of it. And George Huebner challenged the guy to a race. And so he let the guy pick another Chrysler product. And he got the turbine car, and he puts his foot in the brake and floors it. And because of the way that there's no, there's no torque converter in there, you can do that. He winds up to 45,000 RPM. The guy says go, and he takes his foot off the brake. <laughs> thing takes off like a rocket. Now, they didn't want people to know about that, because that's obviously not good for the engine to do it too often. But the point is that you could make them go fast. It was a question of what they were building it for. And the program was designed to actually have a, have a vehicle that anybody could drive without having to think too much about it being different than a typical car of the time. So one drawback, the car does not have air conditioning because air conditioning is a parasitic draw that you can't do much about. Later uh, versions of it, they put the, the air conditioning compressor on the uh, power stage, or on, on the, you know, the output stage, and they could get around some of that, but yeah, other than that, it's fine. So. <laughs> Anything else? Any other questions? Well, thanks again for coming in today. Oh. We're honored to have you as always, and we wish okay. you lots of success with, with the book. Thank you. Thank you.